Hello friends, this is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN merch button click on that it'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that hey on the swag that i'm using it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear sports history network and my favorite podcaster the sports history network store shop there today this podcast is part of the sports history network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport you can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com Hello sports fans and welcome to another edition of Yesterday Sports on the Sports History Network. Today we will continue with part two of my childhood memories, both of playing sports and watching sports. My sports interest peaked in 1970, thanks partly to my second grade teacher, Miss Macia, born and raised in Wisconsin. She was a big sports fan and a Milwaukee Bucks and a Green Bay Packers fan. One day in class, as part of a history lesson, she showed us an 8mm film of the 1967 NFL title game. It was the first time that I had seen the complete game. It was dubbed the Ice Bowl because of its minus 16 degree temperatures. I was mesmerized, and I dissected every play, understanding it for the first time. I thanked her for showing it, and we talked about sports for the remainder of the school year. She'll always be my favorite teacher. Then I started reading sports books and magazines, and watching all the games on television. I watched all the football shows that were on TV at the time. This is the NFL, this week in pro football, the NFL game of the week, NFL films with Ed and Steve Sable. I was like an encyclopedia on NFL football. I knew every player, every statistic, every score, and every team's record and history. Our parents were good about letting me and my brother stay up late to watch sporting events, especially Monday night football. My father would watch it with us most of the time. He would usually send us up to our bedroom at halftime. We always looked forward to halftime because they would show highlights of the previous day's games. There wasn't 24-hour news coverage or ESPN back then, so Monday Night Football might be our only chance to see those highlights. We would watch the rest of the game on our little black and white TV. There were two rules though. Number one, keep the volume and noise level down. Number two, when the alarm goes off to get up for school, you had better be up. We always did get up because we knew if we didn't, that would be the end of Monday Night Football. When we weren't playing in our Little League games, We played a lot of wiffle ball, and in the autumn, we'd play football, tackle if we had enough players. The only equipment we had was a helmet, which was usually a birthday or Christmas present. We'd find an open field and play until whoever owned the property would chase us away. Sometimes they would let us stay. If not, we'd just find another spot to play. If we didn't have enough players for tackle, we'd play touch football out on the street. There wasn't any sense of running the ball in touch football, so every play was a pass. There wasn't anyone to pass block, so you would have to count five Mississippi before you could rush the quarterback. Play calling was limited. Joe, you run it down and out, and I'll hit you in front of Mr. Johnson's Chevy. Bill, you run a curl route, and I'll hit you in front of the manhole cover. Another exciting time for my friends and me was buying and trading sports cards. 
We'd scrounge whatever loose change we could get our hands on and hop on our bikes to race over to the local mom and pop store. Sports cards weren't available 365 days a year like they are now. Baseball cards usually came out in March, and football cards came out in August. You never knew what day they were coming out. We would drive around on our bikes, going from one store to the next, until we finally found some. We couldn't wait to open them. We'd sit on the curb and tear into the packs, the sweet smell of the bubblegum stick wafting through the air. We'd compete to see who could blow the biggest bubble. The gum was delicious, until it completely lost its taste, about a minute later. Then the trading would begin. You would immediately offer it as trade bait if you got a double of the same card. Sometimes the trading could get pretty intense, but some kids would use their doubles to put in the spokes of their bicycle wheels with their mother's clothespins to make a cool motor-like noise. This practice was usually met with a tongue lashing from the mother, not because she cared about your silly cards, but because her clothespins were missing when she needed to use the clothesline. Okay, that will conclude part two. We will have part three next week. Tune in again. Until then, take care and God bless. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. SportsHistoryNetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma-Nebraska football, college basketball art, Michael Jordan items. And so it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can too by visiting SportsHistoryNetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W-1 number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon.